Hello, this is Junu Park, and welcome to On Sapiens Podcast. Whenever I think about human creativity, it fascinates me because it is the art of turning nothing into being, and it is utterly amazing to think these, you know, neurons in our brains producing something that didn't exist before, and the influence that these innovations have to our cultures and our daily lives. Are even more amazing. At times, some innovations can save the humanity. It becomes life-saving innovations, sometimes making our lives more convenient, or they can give us aesthetic pleasures. Hence, we can widen ourselves, widen our perspectives, to be focused in the beauty and awe. But not creation. Not all the creations do the same. Some creations fail, and get forgotten. But there are also other creations that lead to the collapse of the civilization, and the humanity, and the peace. While I while I was contemplating on these mysteries and consequences behind these creations, I had several curiosities towards this. How do people come up with the idea of turning nothing into something? What's the motivation behind human creation? Is there such thing as An eureka moment when we are creating something. What's the secret hack of creative geniuses that we look up to, such as like Leonardo da Vinci? Do creations have to be original all the time? What makes innovation successful? Do other animals possess creativity just like humans do? To solve my curiosity towards creativity, I had a conversation with Dr. Wasserman. Edward Weserman is a professor of psychology at the University of Iowa. His research focuses on the cognitive processes, animal behaviors, and human creativity. In his recent book, *As If by Design: How Creative Behaviors Really Evolve*, in the book he demystifies the process of the creativity and corrects our common misunderstanding that creations are made within a split second. The conversation we had was truly fascinating, and I learned a lot about how creativity became the hallmark of the human mankind. And for listeners who pursue creativity in their lives, I am in no doubt that this episode will be helpful for you. Then, without further ado, this is the conversation with Dr. Wetzerman about human creativity and innovations. Thank you for joining the interview, Dr. Wasserman. It's a pleasure to meet with you. So, before we begin to delve into the mysteries behind the behavioral creations and also the beauties behind the human creation, and you, in your book, you mentioned about different episodes about the how humans have came up with different types of behaviors and. Art, science, and also sports. So before I begin to question those, what were your first moments and like episodes in your life that you realized that oh, this is interesting topic to delve into? What sparked your interest in studying these human creations and innovations? Well, in 1968, I watched the Olympics on television. And I saw Dick Fosbury do something that I had never seen before, and、uh, many millions of others had never seen before. And that was somebody flying over the high bar backward.、Mm. It was stunning. It was surprising, but it was effective, and it captured my interest at the time. But I went on and did many other things without giving it a great deal of additional thought. But as my work in experimental psychology continued, and I taught students, hundreds of students, about the laws of reinforcement and behavior, it seemed that there were too many approaches to creativity that dealt with personality variables, and too few. 
that dealt with the behaviors in question and the consequences and contexts of those behaviors. And so I returned to the Fosbury example because honestly, I had in the back of my mind believed that only Fosbury could have come up with this, that had Dick Fosbury never been born, people would still be going over the high bar in the straddle or Western roll techniques, the the older and uh, even now somewhat newer techniques that were in vogue at the time of 1968. And the more I got into the subject, the more I discovered, wait a minute, there were other people who were doing this. Mm. One of them uh, was Bruce Quandy in high school. After all, that's the time that Dick Fosbury began. And then there was a, 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 a preteen girl uh, who was was also doing this, uh, Debbie Brill. Now, none of these people knew about the others, but they were all experimenting and happening on the same solution, a solution that seems never to have been envisioned before. And so what could have brought about this remarkable uh, coincidence of three people happening on the same solution to a problem that didn't seem to have been a problem. People were going over the high bar. They were setting higher and higher levels. They were achieving uh, new records. And yet here came Dick Fosbury out of nowhere in the Olympics. So Dick Fosbury's prominence is the result of his performing this wildly original technique in the grandest of all places, the Olympic Games. And he didn't just perform it there. He won the competition and set an Olympic record at the time. So that combination of circumstances created the most remarkable instance of behavioral innovation that I had ever seen. And to that extent, uh, it, it was outstanding. It stood out amidst all the other athletic events that were going on in the Olympics at that time. Mm. So that was the first episode. And over the years, I started collecting other episodes, other incidents, other innovations that were predominantly behavioral. And what I wanted to add to the story of creativity and innovation was behavior. Now, it's true that we humans create things, we build things, things, they're tangible objects, computer mice, right? Uh, the the uh, windmill. I mean, we, we've created many devices, but they were the product of behaviors too. And so it, it seemed to me that a, a special path was available where I could try to bring some psychology to bear and also to focus on what might be called behavioral innovations. Then I guess there must be also other types of creation and innovations other than behavioral innovation. In your book, As If By Design, you mainly focus in the behavioral creations, then what are the other types of creations that there might be other than behavioral creation? Well, I would say that all inventions or creations are ultimately behavioral. I mean, uh, you can't, for example, create a theory of relativity without behavior. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a different kind of behavior. It's a kind of cerebral behavior. But ultimately, the theory finds its way onto a piece of paper, or it's implemented today in a computer program. And to that extent, uh, I would say what I'm really looking at is a general theory of creativity. But I've chosen behaviors because, quite honestly, so few other people have. Then it's a, it's a philosophical question, but what do you think is the beauty behind this creative action, which is turning nothingness into being a meaningfulness? Well, uh, the, the beauty of it all is that there's really nothing exceptional about behavioral creativity. 
we create novel behaviors every day. Each of us do things in slightly different ways or rather exceptionally different ways. They don't find their way into uh, newspapers. They don't make uh, major breakthroughs. But often uh, we devise techniques that satisfy our needs. It's all about adapting to a world, a world with challenges and a world that keeps changing. And to the extent that we have to meet those challenges and respect those changes, we're constantly innovating. So my argument is it's actually a very mundane process, mm. but we don't fully understand the uniqueness of our own individual adaptations. Uh, and we pay very little attention to our own behavior. So, I, I mean, I, for example, it's, see, these are behavioral innovations so that it makes it difficult to describe. But if you're wearing short socks, like ankle high socks, and suppose you had a bad back, mm -hmm. you could take your socks off very easily without bending over by simply pushing on the floor and sliding your foot out of the sock. Now, countless others have done this beyond yours truly, okay? Mm -hmm. But it is an innovation of sorts. It, it, it's adapting to a set of circumstances where leaning over is painful. Your sock has to get off and you figure out a way to take it off without having to bend over. So you slide your foot out by pressing on the floor. Simple, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an innovation. No one's going to make me, you know, I'm not going to make a million bucks on this. Uh, but, but it is going to, for me, serve a need. And was I planned at the outset? Of course not. I never planned to have a bad back, but I never, <laughs> but I did have to get my socks off. Mm. And so you might imagine a whole host of different techniques for doing this. Ultimately, this one seemed to work for me. Mm. I'm sure Anna, if we followed you around, we'd find you doing things that are idiosyncratic, that are specific to your environment to your history, to the present needs. And I think that this is true of everybody. So the idea of creativity is not the romantic fiction that most people believe it to be. It's something very practical and worldly. Mm. So when we think about creations, we tend to think about it as a grandiose thing, something that, that have to be big and influential that it will impact a lot of people's life but when we look at it it's actually it comes from mundane activities such as you know ankle socks and yes you know. I, I, th I think that's right mm -hmm. and you know I, I i started off with sports in the book for a very obvious reason mm. what is more bodily than what's involved in sports and in, in physical competition but those aren't the only examples of behavioral creativity. There are many others that, that I discuss, but they're not so readily obvious to casual observers. Uh, sports is such an obvious one uh, that, uh, you know, it's a good place to go in the first place, but it isn't the only place that you can go. Uh, mm. Something else that emerged from the world of sports, but wasn't as specific to sports, was, I mentioned in the book, the high five. Hmm. Now, everybody knows what the high five is. Surely, people have been doing the high five for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, right? Just like handshakes. But not so. The high five, as a matter of fact, is a relatively recent invention. And its origin, well, it's interesting and unusual in its own right. And and for that reason, uh, I've included it in the book. Yeah. So just like our bias on creation, that it has to be grandiose. Like when we look up the word creation in dictionary, or since I love etymology in Latin, it's saying that it is turning nothing into being. Then as in your own standards and in your way of perspective, how would you redefine creation? into what listeners might understand better? Well, 
creations can can happen in a number of different ways. Uh, you might say that my slipping off my sock that in, with that particular method, maybe nobody had ever seen it before. And they would say, well, isn't that remarkable in much the same way that somebody saw Dick Fosbury go, going over the high bar backward? They might say, well, that couldn't have existed before. That had to have been something new. And the high five. Well, if you had been watching sporting events before 1980, you wouldn't see the high five. But, well, uh, subsequently, it's everywhere. And it isn't just in sports. I mean, if you win a spelling bee, right? Yeah. Somebody gives you the high five. If you get into graduate school, they give you the high five. If you win the lottery, they give you the high five. And so we, we take it for granted that so many things that are around now have always been there. They weren't. Things that are common now were once uncommon, didn't exist before. Hmm. And so... Uh, some are more dramatic than others. Some are more consequential than others. But I, I'd like to think that uh, many of them are interesting. You mentioned, right, etymology, words. Yeah. Well, many words didn't exist before, at least as we know them. And I have a chapter on words, where they've come from. And I picked three uh, for the book uh, that well, are interesting. Malapropism was one of them. Uh, ignoramus was another. And robot was another. Well, we think these words must have just somehow descended from the cosmos. And we've had those words all along and used them all along. But it isn't so. And the way we use the word robot in, in reference to an android, an artificial creation, right? that has human-like properties, that didn't exist before. Where did it come from? Well, I tell the story in the book. It, it came from a play by uh, two Czech uh, brothers. Uh, the one brother wrote the play, R-U-R, Rossum's Universal Robots. That's the first time the word was ever used. Now robots are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the origin of that story, you know, is uh, that word is is fascinating in its own right uh, ignoramus is interesting because it came from a play in fact all three of those words malapropism ignoramus and uh, and robot all came from plays dramatic presentations so yeah before uh delving into the process of how humans create and involve in innovation. I want to ask the purpose and the reason behind human creation. I want to ask, why do humans create? Is the creation like the manifestation of the human desire and instinct to progress? What's the purpose behind human creation? So uh, I'll go back to the the more mundane argument that I was advancing before, that creativity is the expression of organisms responding to challenges. And the challenges that are presented are sometimes highly regular, in which case you're not going to see much innovation. If the, if the same challenges are presented over and over and over again, uh, the solutions are likely to be the same over and over and again. But something new has to somehow be injected into the storyline. So I mentioned the, the Fosbury flop going over the high bar backward. You might imagine that that would be a very dangerous maneuver because what it means is, is that you land on the back of your neck. And well, if the landing pits were hard like sand, that really could injure somebody. But it just so happens that although some people were trying it with sand and sawdust, mm -hmm. when Fosbury really worked hardest at getting this maneuver perfected, foam was introduced into the pit. So pieces of foam, foam rubber, could cushion the landing and make it easier on the body when you hit. After all, going over the high bar over is only half of the job. Landing is the other part. <laughs> and if you're going to land on a hard surface, 
you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. And this turns out to be a circumstance that really proved to be critical in this particular method working. If, if, the, if just hard sand, you know, sand is hard if you've ever fallen on sand yeah. at the beach <laughs> or, or gone surfing and hit the sand. It isn't mm -hmm. forgiving. When you hit it, it hurts. And, uh, and so this turns out to have been an important variable in this behavior coming forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, at least for this particular vignette, this particular story is an important ingredient. And every story I should add is different from every other. So in the book, I've collected 25 stories of innovation. Mm -hmm. They're all different from one another. It isn't like you can expect the same story over and over and over again. Yeah. I'm no Darwin. But I think that there's something similar to what Darwin did. Darwin looked at plants and animals, all different kinds of plants and animals and their life cycles and the environments in which they lived. And from all those different illustrations, he came up with a theory of change, of evolution. What I've done is to, let, to collect a much smaller sample of behavioral innovations and trying to figure out what it might be about them that might enable us to at least create a framework for understanding when and how and why innovation takes place. And what I've come up with is what I call the three C's. Context, that is the circumstances in which the behavior is performed. Coincidence, some chance factor that comes into play. And consequence, the result of the behavior. If the behavior proves to be successful, it's likely to be repeated again. And we call that the law of effect. It's a basic law of behavior. So those three factors are almost always involved in one way or the other in this story of innovation. And to repeat, the stories are all quite different. Some of them involve medicine, uh, some of them involve uh, music, some involve culture. All these different things have to be considered. We don't always know the origin, in fact, of these innovations, but we can trace their evolution. Mm. So, for example, the moonwalk. Yeah. If you ask 100 people, 99 will say that Michael Jackson invented the moonwalk mm. 99 would be wrong because he didn't invent the moonwalk the moonwalk has a much longer story to tell it's the most recent predecessor to to michael jackson is a, a dancer and choreographer in los angeles uh, who uh, jeffrey daniels taught michael jackson how to do the moonwalk. But before him, there were a whole series of black dancers who performed a maneuver called the backslide, which made it look like you were taking forward steps, but you were actually going backward. And this was a, dan a dance maneuver without any mime, without hand motions or the like. That existed in the 20s. And one of the first episodes is from a, a cartoon, the priests, the prelude to a cartoon that was uh, from the 20s. And so these dancers had a variety of wild, and crazy and exotic moves of which one of them was taking forward steps, but going backward. It's called the backslide. Mm -hmm. And over years, it developed into the moonwalk. Can we really identify each individual step? No, but we know it evolved. We know it changed over time and we know it reached a certain peak of perfection with Jeffrey Daniels and Michael Jackson. And since then, it's been everywhere. 
Yeah, you mentioned about the three C's, context, coincidence, and consequence. Then to clarify the understanding for the listeners, could sure. how could how could you under how could you apply into Michael Jackson's moonwalk? Okay. Well, that isn't the best example because he didn't invent it. Let's pick something where we have a much e easier time to find the point of origin. Okay. The, the best one is Dick Fosbury. Mm -hmm. So Dick Fosbury was a very poor high jumper. He confessed that he was not a very good high jumper. He was probably the worst in his high school probably the worst in Oregon. And for his height, he may have been the worst in the world. Okay. He tried using a variety of techniques that were popular at the time, but they didn't work for him. And he describes a series of efforts to use what's called the, the straddle, which would be the equivalent of you're throwing one leg over the, the uh, back of a chair, trying to step over it. And as he tried higher jumps, he was finding himself pulling his shoulders back. And as he did that, he discovered that he was able to go over the bar higher than he had before. So what's happening here? He's engaged in a process of varying its behavior, the consequence of which is that he's able to go still higher than he was before. So the context, he's a bad jumper. The variations that he's engaging in are the result of trial and error, which mm -hmm. is a, a basic mechanism of learning. And he gets over the bar and bingo, he's now not only going over the bar higher than he ever went before, but in the Olympics higher than anybody else went over the bar. So the, the coincidence there is the foam pit. Hmm. Without the foam pit, he probably never could have achieved the heights that he was achieving. The other jumpers, when they would land, would not be landing on the back of their neck. So the addition of the foam pit for them wasn't of any real significance. Yeah. So the context is he's not a very good jumper. The coincidence is that there's a foam pit that's introduced to make cushioning on his particular maneuver more graceful and less dangerous. And because he's going over the bar at higher heights than he ever had, that behavior is reinforced. It's strengthened. It's more likely to happen again. Oh, so in for Dick Forsberry, we can apply these three C's, context, coincidence, and consequence. But you told that Michael Jackson's cases is hard to apply. So do you by this do you mean that there are other components in human creations that we we can consider upon or well there's mean? a big one and that's imitation imitation so, oh. so uh you know the, the story of the high five goes to two dodgers uh, who uh, met at the home at home plate and uh, out of the blue slapped hands mm -hmm. over their heads and th th that was the the single episode and it was an expression of joy. It wasn't planned. It was completely extemporaneous. But it very rapidly proceeded through the Dodgers team so that anytime anybody uh, made a good catch or maybe they uh, stole a base, uh, they would exchange high fives. Mm -hmm. And this then could evolve uh, there was reinforcement involved because the dodgers used the high five in their promotional materials so they expressly present on their programs they showed the high five when the dodgers broadcaster vin scully would talk about somebody coming to the plate and high-fiving somebody else <laughs> it became part of a, a cultural phenomenon and so many of these innovations that take place involve an important element of imitation or cultural transmission. And so the, the backslide, remember I said it started off as a relatively, um, uh, what's I would, unadorned technique. You know, you look like you're taking forward steps, you're going backward. 
what Jeffrey Daniel did was to add to that the mime, right? Putting his hands up and, and, and making snap moves. All of those things enhanced the, the effect. And Michael Jackson was a very good student. And he, engaged, he invented some other minor tweaks mm. to the innovation that made his version of the dance different. You, I can't describe these things easily. You have to watch them online. It's very easy to get them. Yeah. You know, you type Jeffrey Daniel and, and Michael Jackson and, and, and Moonwalk, and it's there. I mean, in fact, a whole storyline of how it came about, you can see online. But that's the thing about behavior, okay? I mean, I can tell you that the pencil never existed before. Someone somehow produced a pencil. We don't know who, we don't know how. We take it for granted that at some point it must not have been there, but now it's everywhere. But it's a story we can't tell because we just don't have any data. We have no evidence that we can call upon. So many things are like that where we don't know everything about the origin. Mm. And, and that's why the moonwalk doesn't quite capture everything that you'd ever want to know. But more often than not, we don't know. It's just like Darwin and the evolution of species. You know, we can't trace the evolution of humans uh, with perfection because we're limited by the fossil record. Yeah. Nobody was, we weren't there then to take notes, right? Yeah. And all we can do is rely on, on fragments that we, we collect. We collect more and more of them. And sometimes these stories can be better uh, filled out. But for now, we're sort of stuck with what we've got. Yeah, so it seems that, you know, there are like a lot of statements that creation, creative activities have to be original, but it seems that it's a false statement. And Oh, that, that's one of the, 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 the most common falsehoods. Hmm. Uh, for example, if you say Einstein and you say E equals MC squared, you say Einstein, genius came up with this marvelous equation. Well, do you know how many other people worked on this before and after Einstein? Dozens, over decades. It turns out that there are still questions about its correctness, but that's why they say innovations <clears throat> result from standing on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. and also midgets. So many people get very little credit, but somebody comes along and makes that final, takes that final step that makes something make sense hmm. and they get the credit. So Darwin and the theory of evolution, we say yeah. Darwin, we don't say Wallace. Wait a minute. Yeah. Darwin and Wallace not only came up with the theory of evolution, their papers were read in the same meeting one after the other. Now, Darwin gets the predominance of the credit, but Wallace came up with effectively the same theory. Now it's a sociological issue. Why is Darwin the one get, getting all the credit and not Wallace? And well, that's why we have historians. They try to explain how it is that sometimes the same thing is invented by multiple people, but only one of them gets the credit. And that's the way it is. It's a yeah. quirk of history sometimes. <laughs> you know, in history, we humans tend to glorify those, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci. We tend to glorify him as just a simple world word genius. And then we tend to ignore the process that he made into such a beautiful artworks and his sculptures. But what what stand out to da Vinci the most was his meticulous observation, the ability to create into his imitate other people. So throughout history, who do you think was regarded now as a genius? But in fact, there were more, uh, more things to consider upon. Probably Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. And what makes Thomas Edison so special is that he was so self-derogatory. So you think that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. He didn't. The light bulb was already there. 
What did Thomas Edison do? Why is he deemed to have been the inventor of the light bulb? Quite simply, he perfected it. But it didn't come from insight on his part. He tried like a thousand different materials to serve as the filament of the light bulb. So the incandescent bulb had already been developed, but it wasn't practical. It would burn out quickly and it was expensive. And so what Edison did was through a trial and error process, many more errors than successes, hmm. found the right material for the filament. Now that's just one example. Edison had you know, many, many more patents, but all of these were predicated on advances that other people had made and others in his own team. He had a team of people he worked with. I mean, he wasn't just a guy in, the, in an attic somewhere. I mean, he, he started off that way, but he be, became quite entrepreneurial and <clears throat> became able to harness the talents of other people and bring them together and, you know, make the phonograph. And uh, I mean, you know, it was, you know, it was a factory, an invention factory. But he said himself, I never had an idea. He said, ideas don't originate in the head. They originate in the environment and work and perseverance brings it out. He ex you extract the solutions to problems from the environment where they exist. He said invention or, in, or genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So I'd like to think that one, at least in our country, Edison is deemed to be the most uh, famous inventor. When he's telling us that, do you think maybe we should listen? Yeah. It's not romantic. I understand. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes you have to demystify, mm -hmm. unromanticize these things and get down to basics to really understand the work that goes into it. You know, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, they made many profound statements of how much work and how much frustration and failure they faced in their lives. We come along after the fact and say, genius, and the story is told. That's just supreme laziness. And it, it, it's also insulting. It insults the work that went into the creations exactly like leonard like when we when you look at the time period that leonardo da vinci has made his works it when i examine throughout the duration his of his creation it took almost like 10 to 15 years of making into a sculpture and painting and i thought wow like modern human beings tend to create in the mass consumption society in the consumerism society we tend to create very fast and you know we tend to romanticize the process of creation but when we look back in the history it took you know like a decades into putting into a creation and i thought that was very you know miss like a mystical and that we have to demystify the creative process i couldn't i couldn't agree more i think it's it, it's fascinating that that's the case yeah sometimes we try to to short circuit the problem mm. that is we, we hope to just snap our fingers and, and have a solution and sometimes things like that do happen sometimes they seem really quick so let me give you another example uh, I'm sure that all over the world, uh, Korea included, uh, when babies are born, they take a test. One minute after they're born, they take their first test. It's called an APGAR test. You get a score for five different responsive properties of the baby, their breathing, their color, their response to a, a slap on the foot, uh, their muscle tonus, I mean, five different attributes quickly that are scored. 
And this is really important because until APGAR came along and we had, say, stillborn babies, physicians just let the babies die. They thought they would just resuscitate themselves, and they didn't. And it's estimated that millions of babies, including my mother's brother, may have died because they weren't properly um, uh, stimulated after birth. Mm. So Virginia Apgar, at breakfast one morning, who's working in an anesthesia and surgical ward, is asked uh, by one of the students, you know, we pay so much attention to the mother, but we're not paying very much attention to the baby. How could we get better understand the, the baby's uh, responsivity and the effects potentially of having had anesthetic during delivery of the mother on the baby? And Virginia Apgar takes out a piece of paper from the cafeteria and scribbles five things down on it and says, let's go test these. So she comes up with these five different variables to score. And the APGAR test was right then and there proposed. But of mm. course, it wasn't until 2000 babies later that the effectiveness of the technique had been proven. It yeah. was also the case that it was important that the test perhaps be given not only one minute after delivery, but five minutes just to make sure that that the baby was really as unresponsive as it seemed. And this test also suffered when she submitted the paper for uh, for publication. The editor said, you know, you really you're really on to something, but, you know, it, it's hard to uh, it, it's hard for people to remember these things, you know, uh, there are these five things, but what about these five things? Uh, how, how are they going to remember those five things? And it turns out that somebody, we don't know who, came up with an idea. And the idea was to use the letters of Apgar's name for each of those things. I'm looking for the, the exact names of, of each of these five things. And I didn't have it handy right away. Uh, one of them is appearance. And her names were... Uh, respiratory effort, reflex irritability, muscle tone, heart rate, and color. But that wasn't very memorable. And so somebody came up with what's called a backronym. Mm. In other words, they took the letters of her name and turned it into the name of the score to make it easier for people to remember what they were doing. Oh. And so the origins of the APGAR score came from one simple episode at breakfast Months of work with thousands of babies, the changing name of the test to make it easier for people to remember. And sounds like a simple thing, but somebody came up with a clipboard with a little timer on it and a pencil and the little boxes to fill in so that it made it very easy for anyone, not just a physician, but a nurse or an, an emergency technician to do this. And so the APGAR test is given worldwide to virtually every baby born. And there's a story of innovation. The test didn't exist. Now it exists. What could be more creative than that? Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we credit Virginia Apgar with this. And what's really funny is that she would, uh, when she would teach medical students, they would uh, say, well, this Apgar score, this is really neat. And, she, they, they, and then they would ask her, and your name again was what? <laughs> and she would say, Apgar. And they would say, hmm, how did that happen? Wow. But it wasn't her, it wasn't her invention to use the, the code of her name, those five letters of her name. Mm -hmm. But that's a story. Wow. Now, now, there's a woman whose impact on the world has been enormous. But who knows about it? Who knows about her? Uh, it was she was a, an amazing physician and she went on to do many other noteworthy things but there's a story yeah thanks to the simple breakfast yes yeah one simple coincidence but the context yeah. was that babies were dying and nobody was paying that much attention to them they were paying most attention to the mothers mm -hmm. and then the, the student 
asks this innocent question, why don't we pay more attention to the baby than we're paying to the mother? Mm. And that's how this came about. So sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it's slow, like in the case of Fosbury. You know, he must have tried like thousands of times to go over the high bar and, and been very bad at it, only slowly uh, getting better at it through this uh, gyration of, of, of turning sideways onto his back to go over the bar. Mm. Yeah. So there, in Edgar's case, also, there was a context and also the consequences. Oh, yeah. The consequence was that these babies were then rapidly identified. So physicians mm. could administer respiration, warm up the babies. Sometimes it was a mere matter of keeping them warm because they might be delivered in a cold place. So some very practical things could uh, em emanate could derive from hmm. this simple moment of innovation. Yeah, right now we are trying to debunk the Eureka myth that, oh, that comes out from the instantaneous decision. Then right. I, I also want to talk about the episode of the high five. Like to, as you talked about the high five, the a LA Dodgers Glenn Burke, made a home run, which tend to be the first and last home run of his career. Yes. And then <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a true coincidence, you know. That's, that's, that's an amazing one. A amazing truly amazing one. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the really remarkable thing is that uh, what, what was so special that was, that was going on had nothing to do with him. There were three Dodgers who were on the verge of setting a home run record, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in one season, uh, four Dodgers, and, and they, they each hit, it was it 30 home runs in the, in the same season. It had never been done before, the, the wrecking crew. <clears throat> and Dusty Baker, in the last game of the, of the end of the season, hits this home run, and the crowd goes wild because this record had been set. Mm. But unbeknownst to the crowd, something much more consequential took place. That first high five between Glenn Burke, the sophomore player, and Dusty Baker, the more seasoned player. He's now, you know, the, the manager of the Houston Astros, Dusty Baker. Hmm. And the subsequent story of Glenn Burke, readers can find out more about it. It, it, it wasn't a very happy story for him. Yeah. And yeah. In, the, in the book, you wrote that you know, the Dusty Baker greeted the Glenn Burke, and then he said his hand was up in the air, and though it was arching way back, so I reached up and hit his hand. It seemed like the thing to do. It seems that Dusty Baker was reacting to his what his mind is telling him to do, and it seems that it was an instantaneous thing to do. So, like, how about the context and and in this kind of high five case, was this like a eureka moment? Was it like an instantaneous decision for Dusty Baker to do so? Well, Dusty Baker reacted to Glenn Burke. Mm -hmm. So what was Glenn Burke doing? <laughs> Why was he charging Dusty Baker? Remember, you have to understand the, the circumstance. Dusty Baker is rounding the bases, coming off of third base. Dusty Baker is in the on deck circle waiting to bat next. OK, and uh, Dusty Baker comes across the plate. Glenn Burke comes out and raises his hand high over his head. And what was, what was Dusty Baker going to do? Well, he just reacted to it in a moment of spontane spontaneity, in a moment of exaltation, of joy. And what then becomes crazy is that the next batter is Glenn Burke. And Glenn Burke hits his first and only home run. And Dusty Baker comes out and gives him the high five. So what was learned on that first occasion was reversed. Now, Dusty Baker was giving Glenn Burke the high five when he hit the home run next. There were two successive home runs. Talk about coincidence. And also, I should say, there, like successful creations also require spontaneous, being spontaneous. Can be, but sometimes it can be quite deliberate and, and, and you, you try and try and try and, and, and ultimately something works. Remember, mm -hmm. when 
when Thomas Edison was trying those 1,000 filaments, the first one could have been the, the one that worked, yeah. but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. He said, that to have a really good idea, have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And he also said, if at first you don't succeed, keep trying, because the next one might be the one that works. Yeah. So persistence is uh, is an important attribute in many cases. This is why I say not every one of these examples is exactly like the others. I mean, they do vary from circumstance to circumstance, just like different species differ from one another. You know, the mating patterns of salamanders aren't the same as as macaque monkeys. And yet there must be some kind of rule or, or principle that's behind reproduction and why females choose males, of, of, you know, based on their physical and behavioral attributes. And this is the kind of seeing the, the, the forest through the trees that, that Darwin was so good at, and I'm probably not so good at, but it was my first shot at this. And like I say, it's a framework. It, it's, an, it's an idea. It, it's something that may have uh, practicality and may help others to focus more on the actual development of innovations rather than the final product. It's like you said, people see the final product. They see, wow, look at the Sistine Chapel. Isn't it beautiful? Well, do you know how long it took to paint the Sistine Chapel? What agony and ecstasy there was in the, in, in the painting? And uh, that's all an important part of the story. We just can't forget that. We also can't forget that some people uh, move into something after having been rather unsuccessful. You know, that Einstein was not a very successful uh, young man. His, his uh, major contributions came much later. Uh, he was a postal clerk and, you know, he, he, he didn't seem to have been going anywhere. But then things fell into place for him. Sometimes you can be young and have this happen. Sometimes it's something that takes place much later in life. Uh, all those things have to be taken into account. Yeah, so it's really hard to pinpoint down into what creation are. Sometimes it can be rigidity that makes a successful creation, just like Thomas Edison. Sometimes it can be spontaneity, just like Glenn Burke, but sometimes the creation process can be slow, like, you know, Fors Forsberry, you know, numerous trial and errors, but sometimes it can be fast, just like Virginia Epgard. So, right, yeah. right. You, you just have to, you know, you have to take the world as it comes. You can't force your, your opinions on the world. You, you certainly can't go very far explaining the origins of, of creative behaviors or, or uh, inventions by just claiming ingenuity, genius, mm. uh, or, or a, a, a creative spark or some vision that, that people have. Uh, it, it doesn't get very far. The process of innovation, uh, to be honest, is not planned. People don't follow a script in their lives. You didn't, I didn't, we're not doing what we're doing right now because we always planned to be doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So let me read you a little something about planning. Mm -hmm. Let me say that if you ask me about the creative process, I would say the following things. It's extemporaneous, it's improvisational, and it's unplanned. But let me read a little something. Maybe you've heard this before. You'll let me know. Yeah. You know, what kind of plan never fails? No plan at all. Mm. You know why? Because life cannot be planned. Look around you. Did you think these people made a plan to sleep in the sports hall with you? But here we all are now, sleeping together on the floor. So there's no need for a plan. You can't go wrong with no plan. We don't need a plan to make anything. It doesn't matter what will happen next. Even if the country gets destroyed or sold out, nobody cares. Got it? Now, do you know where that came from? I have no idea. It came from your Academy Award winning movie. Oh, Parasite. Oh. Got it. Oh, yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah. Uh -huh. Best and plan. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> yeah, the best plans often go awry. And at the other extreme, you say, well, don't have any plan at all. But that's probably that's probably too extreme. OK, there's probably a better place to be than having no plan mm -hmm. uh, or or believing that you're going to chart out your whole life in front of you. Mm. Because what happens if your plan doesn't work? Yeah. What do you do next? So when 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 you find out that you can't go over the high bar very well, mm. do you just stop jumping the high bar? Do you just stop the high jump? Do you just quit? Many people would. Most people would. But Fosbury didn't. He persisted, even in the face of failure, even in the face of his coach telling him, you know, you're, you're just never going to be very good at this. And, well, he kept working at it. Yeah. And then, like, one thing I want to mention is that we tend to polarize. Like, for example, not only Thomas Edison was was uh, good at perseverance and he was rigidity in the process of creation, but also at times, I think he was spontaneous in, like, making a bit adjustments in the uh, light bulb and how he perfected the light bulb. So what I meant want, want to mention is that, like, we tend not only the rigidity and the spontaneity, but also the balance of rigidity and spontaneity. How yeah, I, I, right. Yeah. I would say that the, I think rigidity is probably not the clearest word. I think what you'd probably want to say is, oh, people say, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, hmm. you must be crazy because that's the definition of insanity. Oh. If, if you expect to get a different result by doing the same thing every time, Mm -hmm. You're doomed. But what, what Edison did was to vary the filaments. He found one that it, it, uh, didn't work. <laughs> Try another one. Did that work? <laughs> that didn't work either. You keep trying until something works. And maybe it never works. Maybe all your efforts fail. There, I mean, for every famous example of success, there must be 10,000 examples of failure where people had ideas, they didn't catch on, or it took later for them to catch on. So in the book, I describe a technique that a physician here at the University of Iowa developed. He, he came from Spain originally, and his first job was to, to try to understand why surgeries were unsuccessful in fixing clubfoot. And he decided Maybe surgery isn't the right solution. And so he started studying uh, babies uh, who were, who were uh, aborted or stillborn. And he looked at the way the foot developed. Mm. And he discovered that the foot develops normally for a while, but then it starts turning and going wrong. And he reasoned, maybe what we have to do is to progressively bring the foot back to its proper position. So through a series of castings, he moved with great delicacy and dexterity the baby's foot to a new position, closer to normal, and then put it in a cast. And he left it in the cast for several days, then took off the cast, and then adjusted just a little bit more. So step by step, slowly trying to return the baby's foot to its normal position, because he had seen in development in the baby's, in, in the uterus, it had been developing normally, but then it went wrong. So he figured, well, I'll just turn back the clock. I'll just go backward. And he then fixed the babies. His name is Ignacio Ponsetti. He was a wonderful physician. I knew him, the most compassionate, wonderful guy. He said, surgery isn't the solution. I have a better way. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. What an ingenious solution. Guess how old the solution actually was. It turns out to have been something that Hippocrates used 2,400 years before. Wow. <laughs> but it got lost. So this technique of progressive uh, adjustment mm. had been used to success before, but somehow it got lost. And in the, over the millennia, uh, people 
resorted to surgery. And so, so that's the story. Now it's the most successful technique. It's 100% successful. It involves no surgery at all. Mm -hmm. Every baby is, is improved as a consequence. Everyone, no failure. Wow. Then I want to ask about like, uh, in terms of creation and innovations, you know, the like episodes you mentioned in the book were highly successful. And then by now we know some of them that it is widely used and it is successful in saving lives of people. And it is uh, used in popular culture, but also a lot of creations, just like what Thomas Edison did was unsuccessful. In some cases, it turned out to be a failure. Then do you think there is a distinction or characteristics that make successful creations from unsuccessful creations? What do you think makes creation successful and widely used among people? The answer is success. <laughs> success breeds success. If it weren't the case, well, let's just uh, let's have a hypothetical. Here's a hypothetical. Let's simply say that Fosbury was uh, peculiar. Maybe his body was unlike every other body. Maybe he, and only he, would be successful using the Fosbury flop. It's possible. Mm -hmm. Maybe others. Uh, he, he had an American teammate. His other prime competitor was a Russian in the Olympics. Maybe they would never master this technique. And maybe nobody else would. Maybe it was just something weird about Fosbury. Then nobody would repeat it. Nobody would be using it. But everybody is using it now. Nobody high jumps any other way. They have perfected it. I mean, Fosbury, if you go online, you can hear him discuss this. He says that many improvements have been made over his style, you know, how you launch off which foot and how you turn and all those minutial details make a big difference in sports. I mean, after all, we're talking, you know, millimeters mm. difference in swimming. We're talking about hundredths of a second. So when you reach a certain level of, of, uh, of achievement, the improvements that can be gained get smaller and smaller and smaller. And yet people get better and better and better. You know, they used to think the four minute mile would never be broken, hmm. but Roger Bannister did it. And now it's, it's common. I mean, commonplace. And well, I don't even know what the world record is for the, for the, uh, the mile at, at this point, but it keeps getting, you know, faster. And yeah. And so you, you say, maybe there is a strong motivation, you know, to succeed. I mean, after all, if you're involved in a competitive sport, losing is not, is not going to take you anywhere. So that's why I say nothing succeeds like success. Mm -hmm. If something is succeeding, then people are going to do it. And especially in competitive arenas like sports or, 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 or in business, certain practices are going to be adopted more often than not because they're successful and others aren't. And, and that's what competition is all about. But as an individual, you and I, it's making the most of, of our abilities under the circumstances that we, we find ourselves, uh, you know, having grown old, uh, I can tell you that uh, the folks at my, at my gym say, it's not for sissies because you have a lot of ailments. You don't heal as fast as you would otherwise. You can try various uh, athletic maneuvers that in the past you would have caused you no trouble at all, but now you sprain something or break something and, and then it's kind of miserable. So you have to make due allowance for where you are. That's context, you know, the context of, of running uh, of uh, a mile in uh, in less than four minutes, not if you're 85. That isn't going to happen, right? <laughs> I mean, you, 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 there are going to be physical limitations. Mm. And uh, to that extent, there are always physical limitations in, in many things, but um, sometimes there's cerebral limitations. Maybe you just don't have the skills. Mm. I mean, if you don't know, for example, calculus, you, there are problems you'll never solve. 
you can try your hardest, but you'll never solve them. You'll maybe get little approximations to the right answer, but you'll never be able to solve it the way somebody who knows calculus could. Yeah. In your book, you mentioned about uh, creations in different fields like art, sports, science, and also music. How are the creations in art, sports, science, and music are different from each one of them? Well, I wouldn't say that they're characteristically different. Mm -hmm. I would say they're individually different. So uh, you might say in art, how do you create something artful, something that's never been done before? something wonderful. And I have an example of a puppeteer, Basil Twist. It's one of my favorite stories because I actually have met him and corresponded with him. Hmm. And he produced a puppet show without puppets. What he did was to put a variety of different materials in a giant tank and had five people manipulating the materials, silk, spinners, glitter, all kinds of materials, changes in lighting, changes in color. And he put it to music. He put it to Hector Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. And he became famous for this, absolutely famous. Basil Twist's Symphony Fantastique. Hmm. How did it happen? Did he have a, a flash of genius? I'm going to do a puppet show hmm. without puppets I'm going to do it in water and I'm going to use classical music as the, as the uh, score. Well, the story is way more interesting than that. Mm. He was wandering around the streets of New York, looking in recycling piles for material that he could use to make his puppets. And he found an aquarium. It was cracked. He took it home, patched it up, put water in it and started just putting stuff in the tank like uh, ribbon and silk. And he said, well, this stuff, this looks fantastic. I'm going to get a bigger tank. Mm. So he gets a bigger tank so he can put more stuff in it and try more things. And he says, wow, this could be interesting. And he says, I'm going to go searching again. He goes out searching again. And in a little store, mm. he sees a record. Symphony Fantastique. He says, I know that music. My parents had that in their collection. I'm going to take that home. And he puts it on, this, on the turntable and plays it and says, that would be great. So after a great deal of trial and error, the tank is enormous. It's a thousand gallons. In the course of one performance, a hundred gallons are spilled. It takes five people to manipulate this. He needs a pianist to accompany him. It becomes a huge hit. He becomes famous. Mm. All the result of completely accidental happenings, testing by trial and error, knowing a little bit about classical music. And he puts this show together. Mm -hmm. No foresight, no planning, no idea of what it would be, no idea that it would be successful. It was so successful, it was, had to be repeated again years later due to popular demand. He won a MacArthur Genius Award. Wow. <laughs> was he a genius? No. He was a very open, playful, mm -hmm. and experimental artist. Mm -hmm. And he used those attributes, not creativity per se, mm -hmm. and put something together that never would have existed before. It's a great story. It may be one of my favorite stories. It's my second favorite to the Fosbury flop. Wow. And he yeah. was labeled a genius. And he got thousands and thousands of dollars as a reprise mm -hmm. and national attention. Basil Twist, a wonderful guy. So, person. yeah, in creation, also playfulness and improvisation is super exactly. Very important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's the opposite of being rigid. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. the, it's being open mm -hmm. and willing to experiment. That is the thing that, if you really wanted to encourage young people, would be a for very you good after thing to do. observing like yeah. more than twenty episodes in also in book and also while you're researching for like twelve years. 
like you also have must have encountered other creations that human have made then how did it impact you as a person like did you became the master of creativity did you tend to have a simple breakfast or did you just made as many mistakes as possible like how did it change you as a person when after learning about all the episodes well i have a great deal of respect for people who achieve greatness okay uh, and, uh, and just as much as anyone else would but i just don't look at it quite the same way i don't attribute it to some characteristic or skill or ability or native talent that they have that nobody else has hmm. i think there's creativity in everybody and what seems to happen is we kind of get punished for being creative and if you if a student in class makes a comment that seems really crazy and you just don't know how to respond to it and you say well maybe that's okay maybe it isn't and well maybe you're discouraging the, the student from coming up with a really great answer because either they didn't express it clearly you didn't understand it clearly so um, it's so easy to uh, to in some ways slow down the process little kids seem to be more inquisitive more willing to take chances to do things un in an unusual or or unorthodox way and uh, as a result uh, they may learn some tricks some ways to respond that uh, maybe none of us have ever thought of uh, often kids have certain physical disabilities but they can learn to adapt and adjust to those disabilities in sometimes the most imaginative and creative ways and to them it's the only way to go and and so people little kids who had club foot would before this technique came along just walk on the sides of their foot well it wasn't very successful in a certain sense they could get from one place to the other but it wasn't that they couldn't move it was just so painful and 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 so stigmatizing because they didn't look like other kids and uh, you know it was a it, it posed a real hardship for them and now we know that they don't have to suffer that hardship mm. yeah like uh as as right now in the modern days we are since it's an internet age we are access to a lot of clips from YouTube's and episodes from Netflix, a lot of movies like Parasite. So we, <laughs> we have like a mass consumption of information and over abundance of information. So in certain periods like this, are we struggling to create? You know, that's a great question that one of my one of my students I thought asked the question but then when I asked them, did you, is this what you were getting at? They said, no, but uh, you've asked it in a way that I interpreted it. And it goes like this. Are we at a certain point in time where our own process of innovation is different because of all the other innovations that are around us? Are we in some ways limited to what we can create? Maybe there've been so many other things created that what's left for us what is there for us to do, you say? Hasn't everything already been invented before? And I would have to say, no. I still think there's plenty of room for uh, innovation, for us to unleash our talents. Uh, and we, we might deem it to be a really challenging environment. Where would we go? What would we try to invent? And the thing is, who goes out and tries to invent something? you know what is it you really want to invent if what you're trying to do is come up with the next big thing it's going to be tough but if you see a real need something that you think you could improve that's a place to start so we're constantly making improvements refinements mm -hmm. all the time and why is it that we want to buy another iphone or why is it that we want to get an electric car? You know, electric cars. Here's a fun story. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford worked on and built an electric car before the car with the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. 
but it wow. was no good because it had no range, right? And it would overheat because the batteries, the technology for the batteries just weren't very good. Well, look where we are now. The cars, <laughs> the new electric cars still don't have a wide range, <laughs> right? And because of that, we don't have enough chargers for them and they still overheat and sometimes catch fire. So what they did is they ultimately abandoned the electric car and went to the internal combustion engine because coincidentally, petroleum was to be found in abundance. Mm. And that meant it was gonna be a lot cheaper and easier to build internal combustion engines. Gas stations could be outfitted across the country. It was more easily tran you know, uh, uh, transported. And so the context was one in which un until the, all that petroleum had been discovered, the electric looked more promising, but once it did, changed the game mm. and electric cars pretty much disappeared. But some of the first cars were electric. Yeah. But now that petroleum is depleting, we are ten, we, the focus, the attention tends to move on to the electric car. That, uh, the context has changed. It gets mm -hmm. harder to extract the uh, petroleum and worse, the byproducts of burning it are, you know, creating global warming and potentially a hole in the ozone layer. And, you know, there, there are negative consequences of, of uh, internal combustion engines. Mm. Uh, and so we, we are in the midst of another, quotes, revolution. That's why every car company, including in Korea, is, uh, is making electric cars. Mm. But now comes the, what has to go with it. And by the way, to make an electric car, you still have to use metal, plastic, right? Uh, and, and hydrocarbons. And for that reason, they still generate pollution. They may not generate as much when they're on the road, but you, then they have to generate the electricity to charge the batteries. How do we generate the energy for the bat to charge the batteries? There we go again. The coal plants to burn coal for electricity is not a solution. We have to do something else. So you can see how all of these things get interwoven. Mm -hmm. And so to make the a, a passenger car or a truck or a big transport that's energy efficient, that's non-polluting, it's a challenge. And we're right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So it what? Yeah. yeah. What I understand from you is that although there is a massive consumption and massive production in different industries, first of all, we oh, like a like creativity doesn't have to be grandiose. It doesn't have to be a huge invention. And secondly, the context is instant. Context is always changing. For example, like petroleum back days were, uh, like, or like there was like superfluous amount of petroleum right. but now the electronic car is getting more attention and also like there like for example like mentioning about the movie parasite there is a social context where they try to criticize the gap between the rich and poor and also the context social context is also changing every time due to political reason and also sociological reasons so so what I understand from you is that although there is a massive consumption, since the context is instantaneously changing, we have a lot of things to create depending on how we look at the create, how we look at the perspectives or context, right? Yep. Hillary Clinton once said, the only thing that's constant mm -hmm. is change. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And the, uh, the world changes around us constantly. Mm. And well, sometimes we are the re we are creating the changes, and they're often not for the better. Mm -hmm. And this is why overpopulation and pollution are are such serious issues because they're the consequence of our own behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like before I wrap up this conversation, I want to you know uh, give attention to other animals other than humans so i know that you have researched about the pigeons and i was you know enthralled by how intelligent how like 
intelligent peasants are compared to our expectations. So how is this creativity shown in other animals other than humans? Well, the book has some re really interesting examples. They don't all involve pigeons. In fact, none of them do. Sorry to say to my pigeon friends <laughs> that I don't have any great stories of innovation in pigeons. But monkeys will floss their teeth with their own hair or the hair of one of their friends that they're grooming. Mm. Or in India and in Ceylon, they jump on the heads of tourists, especially women with or men with long hair, and pull out strands of hair and floss their teeth. So in the book, I give the example of the man who's first credited with creating dental floss. But we don't really know much about that story. But the story of how it is that monkeys might have invented floss or engage in flossing hmm. involves two possibilities. One, it's aversive to have food in between your teeth. So using floss gets it out. But that, there's another possibility. When you floss your teeth and dislodge some food, you get another taste of the food. So on the one hand, you may be removing something aversive. On the other hand, you may be gaining something pleasant. And how it is that you would be engaged in, in, in hairs and your mouth at the same time, well, you could imagine maybe uh, when you were eating, uh, you still had some fur on your hands and it just accidentally you happened to pass the, the strands of hair through your teeth. And so the people who studied monkeys uh, in this project suggested that it was an altogether possible explanation. And now it's spread. It, I mean, if you go to these, this temple in, in India or this place in, in Ceylon, uh, dozens of monkeys are jumping on the, on the backs <laughs> of tourists, pulling out hair and, <laughs> and flossing their teeth. So once somebody figures it out, others do. But the interesting thing is just a few miles away, the monkeys elsewhere, where there aren't tourists, they don't do it. <laughs> so you can see that sometimes the innovations are somewhat localized mm. in much the same way that the Dodgers were doing the high five. Yeah. But the other teams weren't, at least for a while. Mm. Wow. So there is social contagion that does go on. And that's interesting. Another area that's really interesting in the book is self-medication. Mm. So uh, to cut to the, to the point, chimpanzees, if they get sick, will often eat at, or gnaw at a root, which is very bitter. And they don't eat it. They spit it out. But the, the, the white uh, liquid inside Hmm. They'll ingest. And the next day, they're all better. <laughs> and the belief is that the, the, that the chimps have discovered that if they're ill, if they're having this uh, intestinal problem, which is caused by parasites, different parasites, <laughs> uh, that, that it kills the parasites and the chimps get much better. Now, the best part of the story, not only do the chimps do it, but the people's the native peoples who have watched the chimps do this and they do the same thing when they get sick, mm -hmm. they gnaw on the same plants to get better. Wow. So humans are copying the chimps mm -hmm. who have figured out a way to self-medicate. Is that wow. crazy or what? Wow. It's fascinating. <sighs> now, was this done with planning and foresight? Was this done because they had gone to medical school? <laughs> I mean, come on, be real. And so we often make jokes about uh, folk medicine yeah. and think it's crazy. And, and, and we want something that's, you know, we, we buy from a pharmaceutical company. But who knows? Maybe there's greater wisdom and effectiveness in some of these folk medications than we, than we know. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. So not only like, uh, we also have to consider the artificial selection, which Wallace have proposed. Yeah, 
which is, you know, like, although Charles Darwin got spotlight, we also have to still consider that there is a work of Wallace who have given the spotlight of how the human's behavior have changed. Yeah, yeah. In essence, talking about here is a case where the individual person Mm. can evolve and innovate in much the same way that over time, Mm. species and cultures can innovate and, and, and evolve. So in our lifetimes, we learn through a process of trial and error. Yeah. And this is why I say success plays such a key role. Of course, failure plays a key role too. Yeah, so my last question is that, uh, so in the midst of mass consumption and mass production, so young people who pursue the creativity in their own life, do you have any advice for these young people? Oh, without doubt, be persistent. Be prepared to vary your behavior. Mm -hmm. Remember, doing the same thing over and over again is not going to give you the same result. Mm -hmm. Try new things. You might not have to to deviate by so much. Mm -hmm. It might not be a, a gigantic change, but some change will be, uh, if you're failing, more likely to succeed than doing the same thing over and over again. But it is very easy to get frustrated and and to to become disillusioned. Uh, And, you know, when people write a play and they send it to 25 places and nobody accepts it, you know, what what message do you get from that? Well, who really knows? Uh, Sometimes dumb luck steps in and the 26th time you send it, Mm. it it will get accepted. Yeah. For these, for these young people, do you have any like a recommendation of a, you know, like a book or autobiography or film or documentary or a role model that, you know, sparks the spirit of creativity and perseverance and also openness to changes? Boy, that's a, that's a, a really good question. And I, I still think that Edison is a, is a, is a terrific place to start. Mm. He's, a, he's a really good place to start. Mind you, this is all about creating things, but in terms of uh, being successful over a long period of time, uh, here's another one. Okay. Jerry Seinfeld. Mm. Yeah. So Jerry Seinfeld, I mentioned in the very end of the book, mm. He's a comedian, in case your audience doesn't know. And he works really hard at his jokes. Before he had the television show, he was a stand-up comic. And he would work feverishly on his material. Mm -hmm. And he could sense when the crowd was going with it and when the crowd was tuning out. Mm -hmm. He would make adjustments from performance to performance based on the feedback that he was getting from the audience. And the basic idea is that as you perform, you adjust and you change your material in accord with the audience's reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, if the audience keeps saying, boo, get off the stage, you probably need to look into another line of work work. But uh, Jerry Seinfeld is a really great example for somebody who is a scientist of comedy. Mm. He takes it really seriously. And in the book, there's a a description of of Seinfeld and his technique that you might look at. Uh, So when I'm talking about uh, uh, creation and invention, look at the difference. You've got Edison on the one hand, and you've got Jerry Seinfeld on the other but there's a certain common modus operandi, a common MO Mm. of craftsmanship, of working at your art, trying things, experimenting, keeping things that work, abandoning things that don't, but always being willing to vary, to alter your, 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 your approach, because the same thing again and again is unlikely to succeed. Exactly. The conversation today must have benefited the listeners who pursue creativity and who 
really wants to uh, value the creation as the highest value in their life. And thank you so much for the conversation today. It was really enthralling and awe-inspiring. It was just a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>